Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining the Pasco School Board of Directors this afternoon for our regularly scheduled board study session. We're going to focus on early learning this afternoon. We appreciate all of our learning, lear, early learning partners that are here. Some of them are here with us this afternoon. And uh, this became a real focus of the board, probably uh, increasing early learning opportunities for our district. Almost, almost four years ago now, we really started talking about it a lot. And uh, I know every, everything that's good takes time. And uh, it's taken a little bit of time to get these programs in place, but we appreciate all the district staff and, again, our partners that, that helped this happen. And we're excited uh, to move in, to move some of our earliest learners into the new Early Learning Center this, uh, within this next year. Um, and with that, I'll leave it to, well, let me say that this is a regularly scheduled study session and open public meeting for the Pasco School Board of Directors. Uh, if you want to see the study session on YouTube, look at Pasco Schools under YouTube, or you can see it on uh, Charter Cable TV channel 191. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Dawkin. Okay. Thank you. So um, we're here tonight to share a little bit about the work that we've been doing in early learning, give you a bit of an update, and um, we want to, at this time, to recognize some of the partnerships that we have created with some of our um, local agencies or friends out there, and really show our appreciation for that partnership that they've had. Um, for me, I know I couldn't do it without their partnership, because um, they're bringing some expertise in some programs that I think are very valuable um, as we try to saturate our community with different early learning opportunities. So um, just to kind of go back to our outrageous outcomes, um, as we look at our uh, early learning um, efforts, um, they definitely su support the 100% of our third grade reader graders reading on grade level in their native language of instruction, as well as 100% of the students passing algebra by the um, end of the ninth grade. So. Um, without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce to you um, Rick Donahoe and Joanna Flatten, both from the, Nash the Children's Reading Foundation, and they will be um, sharing a little bit of information about some of the highlights with um, the Ready for Kindergarten work that we started and, and what's coming up on the horizon. So. Okay, thank you, Christy, for being here. Please be here. Um, I'm the CEO of the Children's Reading Foundation. I'm also going the Richmond School Board meeting, and I have a meeting at 6.30 tonight, or 6 o'clock to me, so I'll be moving along. So, um, Joanna, go ahead. You can talk I am to. Joanna Flatten, and I work for the local chapter of the Children's Reading Foundation. And they're actually the ones serving you directly. So I was here back in February, I think, presented some of the status to you at the time. So nationwide, 40% of kids come to kindergarten <clears throat> without the necessary skills where we be on grade level and continue from there. So anywhere from one to three years behind. So that's a lot of kiddos showing up. You see those, we see those in Richmond too, other places, but across the country it's a, it's a real thing. Talk to you about this, um, this slide too. And some things I want to show you here are um, kids coming to school from zero, birth to five come to our schools somewhere between three years behind and two years ahead of, of grade level. So as things progress, I'll take the green one, the kids on grade level. So second grade, they go off third grade, and they do about a year's growth each year. This is 2.3 children tracked longitudinally from the Northwest Evaluation Associates on an RIT scale, which is a normalized scale, including reading, for how they're progressing on grade level. So 2.3 kids. Hmm? 2.3 million, not 2.3 kids? 2.3 million kids? Okay. Picky, picky, picky. So if you're on grade level, you're going to have a 10% chance of dropping out in high school, 25% chance of enrolling in university. So how much transfer is there between these bands? So about 80% of kids will stay on their band or go up or down one band. So a little bit of movement. We do interventions. You do interventions all kinds of things to get kids cut up. The kids down here in the lower, lower levels are two to three years behind, 75% of those kids will not change. So they'll be in these lower bands. So for example, if I'm three years behind and I show up and I get to fourth grade, 
yes, I've gone up to grade levels, which is great. Teachers are doing well in school, but I'm the equivalent over here of a, ch a child who's in second grade, if you will, a little bit further behind. So I'm catching up year to year, but I'm never always catching up. So these lower kids come up here, 55% chance of dropping out of high school, less than 2% chance of going to university. So what we want to do is impact the kids before they even show up to school. Kindergarten teachers, even with all day K, full day K, which is a wonderful thing, they can't catch all these kids up. And we see it talking to kindergarten teachers across the state for sure. We had a national grant, we saw that. They're just not ready. They don't know numbers, letters, that sort of thing. So this is something just to keep in your mind. Yes, some kids catch up, years worth of growth in school, but not, they cannot literally catch up to where they need to be on grade level. So, Christy and Karen, we have a present for the board that you'll probably end up with. So if you can take that and spread that out a little bit, it's a banner, that's the bottom. And this is something I want to leave with you. It's long. You're doing great, but we rehearsed this, remember, Christy? We rehearsed this, yeah. So it's a band that just says, what you do matters. It's from the Children's Reading Foundation. It's sort of our mantra for the year that shows, and you can show the camera over that side. So, good at this, yeah. So it does matter. So you wanna to read to your kids, talk with kids, play with your kids, engage with your kids at all times, starting before birth. You read to your kids in utero. They hear it, they hear the voices, they're learning at all times. When are they not learning? When they're sleeping. Otherwise they're learning all the time. They're observing you, observing things going on. So what you do matters as school board members, as parents, teachers, so forth. So what's happening in Pasco? Joanna, Wonderful. microphone. Um, so really quick, we have the two newest programs that are developed in partnership with you um, that we love, but I also just wanted to take a quick second and highlight a couple of the other programs that have been ongoing with the Children's Reading Foundation in Pasco. So um, every summer we do the summer read-up read program at the McDonald's in, on Court Street and on Road 68. We have an average of 50 to 100 kids that show up with their families, get a free book, participate in story time for six weeks in the summer, as well as doing book distribution, two books to every kid in summer school with our read-up program. Um, and our first teacher libraries is reaching first teachers who are in their first year of certified teaching full time. No, first year of full time teaching since becoming certified. So they get 75 new and used books to kind of kickstart in their classroom. There's been about 20 requests from Pasco school teachers so far this year, um, and we are continuing to field those. And then these two new programs, the child care provider training that um, we're doing our last one Thursday night, so in two nights. Um, so the Ready for Kindergarten program that you've already heard about has a, has a kit that's specifically designed um, for child care providers, and it's designed also in particular for mixed age groups, meaning um, most home providers have kids from say one or even younger all the way up to five, six, eight or nine. And so the tool band um, that we've been teaching is targeted at two to five year olds. Um, and it's been, so they've had four different sessions teaching um, childcare providers about utilizing these early learning tools in their home. And it's been wonderful. Um, I would just a little off, but kudos to you all and Karen, um, listening to providers have conversations and the level of, um, of work to integrate everything they're being told about licensing and early learning in order to fulfill their passion of knowing that the kids in their care are ready for kindergarten is just remarkable. And I think um, that program is meeting an incredible need in the Pasco community. It was um, really neat to be able to be a part of, so thank you. And then we have begun getting ready for kindergarten ready to start here on October 12th. Um, we've trained about 25 facilitators so far and are continue to train some more. So lots of local of your kindergarten teachers, some paraeducators, some local parents, a couple folks who um, live in Kennewick who heard that the program was starting and are passionate about um, supporting families. It's been wonderful and um, registration so far has gone overwhelmingly well. So um, at last count a week ago over a hundred families had registered so far. Um, the very first session at McClintock, I think there's like 43 kids already signed up for childcare, which is great. Um, it's been really exciting to see the overwhelming um, 
welcome um, and excitement that folks have for the program and to see families from the different schools enrolling to see our Spanish line also ringing off the hook with um, folks who speak Spanish and are excited to enroll. So um, we're really excited to see how that unfolds. I just talked a lot. Are there questions or things I should have talked about? So the one thing I will say, having some, seen some of this started in Richmond and carrying over, is um, you want to go to a Ready for Kindergarten class and you want to go to a child care provider class session just to see who shows up, the kind of people who are there, uh, what goes on. Um, it's, a, it's a real honor to be able to watch what happens. Karen's another Christie there to see how hungry these parents are, these child care providers are, just get something, teach me, help me deal with kids. So it's a great thing just to go and observe. It's a little different from being in a, class, a science class from a ninth grade or whatever. So just a very positive, networking, hungry group of people that, that want to do things. So you all are killing Richmond, by the way. So I need to go to that school board meeting and get on them. So, which is great. It's wonderful what you all are doing. So. Anything else? So before I ask this question, I have to say the, the importance of this, I know it goes it goes beyond finances and we as a board and district have, have embraced that. But I'm just curious. So um, I know Pasco residents have taken advantage of um, Ready for Kinder when it's in other districts. And you said some Kennewick people sign up. How does it, is, is Pasco the district only on the hook for paying for parts of it from students in Pasco and the Reading Foundation picks it up for kids outside the district or how does that work? That is a great question. So when I say that some folks from Kennewick are coming over, they are coming over to help facilitate because they've had an experience as a Kennewick parent okay. and they're passionate about teaching and so they're coming to teach. Um, the re it is a requirement that um, to sign up for the PASCO sessions that they be have a child who lives in the PASCO in your PASCO school district boundaries that they have a future PASCO. So right now we haven't opened any of the PASCO up to anybody else. Kennewick in the past has um, allowed us to um, let parents pay from out of district to attend. Um, that's how that's happened, but yes. So it's it's paid by a family when that, right when now that Pasco's happens. not doing it, but it, when that happens, it's generally paid by the out of district family? Yes, okay. correct. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question, thank you. How much growth do we see um, with those numbers in that chart? So when you, had, is there enough data from Ready for Kindergarten to see um, what the change is in these kids? How much they can grow? Can they change multiple, um, that path is that they're on. Um, I'd just love to know what the results, what results we can expect in PASCO in getting our kids more um, ready for kindergarten. That's a really good question. Um, I we, we, we have not yet done a true longitudinal study yeah. ourselves to do that. We did a randomized control trial that actually Joanna had it up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We were talking about that. So. Um, it's not longitudinal data. It was data that was taken over. Um, it was conducted by Dr. Paul Strand here from WSU Tri-Cities in conjunction with Dr. Kuntz from the Professional School of Psychiatry in um, neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago, serving um, two of the schools were in primarily, I would say, about 80% Latino communities, and then one of the schools was in a primarily African-American community. And we used the Dibbles um, letter naming and letter sound fluency test, as well as the Woodcock-Johnson three letter um, letter naming, is that correct, the literacy um, component? It's been a while, I apologize. Um, and so that was, and it was randomized control trial, meaning we recruited all of the families saying you would either be assigned to take ready fall, winter, spring, like PASCO is choosing to do, or to have a delayed ready the following summer. And then they were random line, using a computer program assigned to one of those. So realizing our goal there was to control from for the fact that a lot of times your initial data can be impacted by the fact that the parents who are stable enough to get there to the class can be a higher, if that makes sense. Like a more, am I articulating mm -hmm. that well? I apologize. Um, and so in that trial, so those kids did their initial testing in- and Ages of the kids? They were um, three to five year olds, mostly four to five year olds, but there were definitely some three year olds thrown in. So this was after getting this year of ready um, and we did the pre-testing. Um, no, we didn't do pre-testing. We did all of the testing following their completion um, of the three components, and the randomized controlled trial did find significant improvements for the kids whose families had participated in Ready over their peers in that same cohort. Um, there were, I think, in the end, 178 participants in the study, um, and in demographics that um, for two of the three schools are not my understanding, unlike PASCO's um, as a resident and as looking at their demographic study, um, actually a lot 
poorer, I would say, because 97% um, of the kids in the, on average of those three schools were in free and reduced lunch. So that doesn't, that gives you a short term. We know that it's impactful. It doesn't answer long term yet what you see in third, fourth, sixth grade. How long has Ready for Kindergarten been around? 11 years. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you all want to sponsor a longitudinal <laughs> study, keep track of all your kids that go through, <coughs> we're looking for someone to team with. It's well, tracking what? a lot of kids for a long time with all other variables set aside and it's a bit of a, yeah, I think it'd be something that would be possible, you know, with we're required to do this walk kids assessment where they're we're assessing essentially I think six domains and our numbers last year were you mentioned forty percent, ninety percent roughly of our kids are behind in at least one domain, many obviously in multiple domains. So that would be an easy thing to assess over time and just break out the ones that participated for one year, two years, mm -hmm. three years, four years, five years, and ready for kindergarten because it's a five-year program, yep. and then comparing that to their peers, average on walk kids. That, that would seem to me be data that we're kind of already collecting, that we just add this variable of did they participate, how many years did they participate, you know, did the family participate in ready for kindergarten, and then five years we could have some pretty good data as far as the effect on those kids and on our walk kids scoring. Is, does that seem reasonable, or am I missing something there? Christy would be great doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I do know other schools, because of the grant, um, added like on their kindergarten intake form that exact piece of information and they tracked it. It just wasn't, I don't have a formal study to quote from what their results and, were. And we have done that also. Matter of fact, um, Mark Garrett couldn't be with us today because he's in Florida at a training. However, he, um, Eric Bowles and Christy Dawkin have met um, extensively and Mark has some ideas about how we may track some data over time and he has a very sophisticated approach to it. So um, Christy will be back in front of you later on this fall into the winter to talk about our Walk Kids data. At that point Mark will be part of that presentation to talk about what his thoughts are in terms of doing a, a deeper data analysis. In your in your research that you did, did it also help? Did it just help kids in like math and ELA, or did it also help them in social and behavioral um, readiness for kindergarten? We did not evaluate that piece, okay. which is a terrible answer, but the truth. Um, so anecdotally, I know it's been helpful. The other thing I can't speak to because it wasn't a true. Um, so one of our grant sites was Pateros up in. Um, North um, and yeah. correlated to them having ready for kindergarten and they managed to have 23 of their 27 incoming students all go through ready for kindergarten and their data went through the roof. There's no way it's students from a year ago and students from this year and so we think that that's a really strong correlation but there's no controlling for any other inputs that might have also changed as well as them receiving ready as a whole in the community. But you certainly have social emotional Yeah. You talk to kindergarten teachers. Well, you talk to kindergarten teachers and they said if you can just get the social and emotional <laughs> yeah. under control, we can handle the rest. Yeah. I heard that last month. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's tricky. This type of social science studies are difficult, right? Because there's so yeah. many confounding factors. Uh, for me, you know, it's you break all that down and I, I'm confident that we can show improvement, you know, in, in further studies. And the study you mentioned is very good if you randomize it to, like you said, because if you just look at the groups, well, the, the group that may be participating is going to select out people that are somewhat motivated, they're involved, they're going to take their kids there, or the parents are going to go and get the information. So that kind of naturally may self-select people that are going to not mm -hmm. be as, you know, maybe in a better situation. But if you randomize the people that are participating, well, that's pretty helpful, you know, to, to say, okay, well, we're going to just split you up. Uh, and, and so, but these, this type of data is difficult and, and you look at a social emotional, the development is influenced by so many factors. Yeah. So it's a little bit tricky, but uh, for me, it's just, you just break it down to the right thing to do. I mean, this is just the right thing to do is to empower parents as their child's first and most important and beloved teacher. And, and if we get that, they can modify the situation for all of their children. I mean, so th this, this type of situation and model is really ideal because of the basic principle that it underlies, and, and so there's no doubt that it will have a, a good impact. So some of these studies suggest where can we go to get a hold of parents, young parents, before they get in, into schools? What's the one thing most parents have in common? Where do they go to? They go to a pediatrician who is often 
a, a one-stop shop to do social emotional evaluations, those sort of things. So if you all know of any pediatricians <laughs> who might be interested, right. it's actually a thing that people talk about because 99% of parents will go to a pediatrician. So there's a source there, if you will, for evaluation. Yeah, no, just, pressure. No, pressure. no, no, no credit. We already fenced, just so the board knows, I've already contacted Ms. Doc, and we have materials now that I'm going to take to all the pediatric offices in Pasco, including my own, and so that they will personally invite families right. uh, in this age range to participate. So I have no doubt that that 100 or whatever it is is going to be much larger by the time this starts. I'd, I'd also like to um, acknowledge Dr. Richardson's help and support with us in Reach Out and Read. He's also been really instrumental in um, his leadership in the community has been fantastic. So I also wanted to acknowledge his efforts in that regard. So I've got a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, I, I'm glad there's lots of enthusiasm. I think that's a great thing. There's a couple of things. Um, do we have any correlation on how many of the kids are failing or not doing well in the WA Kids assessment are actually signing up for this program? Or is it too late by then to get ready? That is a good, so in terms of as an outside partner, we could, in terms of student confidentiality, I would have you all are better experts than me. I'm looking at Christy. We certainly have a list of but we don't, because they're, they're preschoolers right now, right? Like everybody who's coming to Ready for Kindergarten. Um, so we have the parent name and phone number when they sign up and the name and the birth date of their child. And they're going to come. Um, so that doesn't, so, sorry, I'm bouncing around realizing that doesn't answer your question at all. Well, so, yeah, I, I think, so they don't, Ready for Kindergarten obviously takes place before they get to kindergarten. Yes. They don't, don't do the Wildcats assessment until they... In are almost ready for dinner. Yeah. So I guess my question really is this. So we, um, so I heard you say you went to McClintock. You've got lots of excitement mm -hmm. up there at McClintock. They are the very first session in particular, yeah. Okay, are you planning to come to some of our more impoverished schools? Absolutely, and we've Robinson, been, like I was Chess. at um, Emerson's open house, for example, and okay. we signed up. We had maybe 20 families sign up who were excited, and I would say 50% of them did not speak English when I interacted with them. Um, in terms of language abilities, I know that doesn't, that makes a stereotype assumption that the folks who don't have English as the primary language are part of your target demographics. Um, we've been at, an, at events at Virgie or going again to other events. So we're, um, we are doing our best. We've, we're at an event at the Union Gospel Mission at the end of August promoting Ready, saying Pasco's bringing in this new program. We go there every August to give away books anyways. And so really trying to build that excitement and enthusiasm. So we are absolutely committed to trying to be in the places and connect with the folks um, who are working with families that maybe aren't getting the announcements on Facebook, for example. Um, we are open to, like we've put out, and we are starting to hear back as this program builds momentum from the folks who said, oh, wait, can you come? We're doing a kindergarten whatever night at our school. Will you be able to come? Or we've got this community event. And we also, like, we reach out to um, a list of a whole bunch of child care providers in the Pasco School District. So the bigger ones, we hand deliver everyone else. We mail out um, flyers. Um, we are in contact, we're a part of the Early Learning Alliance, so um, getting materials out to all of those, for, to the Head Starts, to the home visit folks um, who attend those meetings. So trying to work with all the different networks to reach families as best we can. And we're open, if you have a place you'd like us to be, let us know, and we will do our best to get there. I, I'm just imagining, and I could be in, inaccurate in this, but those parents who are very engaged and very concerned about their children, this would be something that they would be very interested in. Mm -hmm. Those who are not aware of these types of things or don't know, don't feel the responsibility, or not, not because they don't care, but just don't know mm -hmm. how, would probably be less inclined to be uh, to participate in this and let, until they get there and find out that, that, that there's something they can do. And that and maybe Ready is not the one to target those. Maybe there's another program for that um, that would be that would target those persons. Uh, the other thing is the child care providers. You talk about you talked about that mm -hmm. targeting them. Are we going to? And I'm assuming that the things you've said we're going to those who are probably more you know, whose parents work in the fields, uh, less income. 
are, are those the types of, are those child care providers coming and participating would be the in, question, I guess. So in the child care provider trainings? Yes. Is that your question, just to make sure? So yes, and um, so we have, and Karen's gonna talk a little bit more about some of that, but um, we do have a, a quite a, a large number participating, and uh, many of those are um, providers who are receiving subsidies from the state, so they are potentially reaching some of our target population that we would want to be accessing ready. Um, I've also spoken with and met uh, with the home visitors and given them information so that as they're um, inter interacting with um, families coming into the schools or out in the community, they have a lot of great connections that they've been provided with information to um, recruit for us as well. As, then we also have, um, like if you call on the phone line right now, you can hear Shane and Gracie um, promoting uh, ready on the, if you get put on hold. Uh, so there's several different things. Gracie's planning an uh, event, or I don't know if it's an event, a session with Univision to try and connect with some more families. Um, and all of the elementary schools are receiving flyers that are going home um, in their Wednesday envelopes or however they communicate. So that we're trying to saturate as much as we can in as many avenues as we can to recruit all families, so. So I would be interested to hear those statistics on when you get into the schools that we would expect to be pre and higher free and reduced lunch population, how it's received there versus those that would that are more affluent. And same with childcare providers, we have, uh, I would expect that, that where farmers or where the parents are working in the fields, they're probably not going to license daycare. They're probably going more to grandma or aunt or, or somebody else's mom, and so probably not being served like some of the others. But uh, that would be interesting information as well if, we're, if we can get that. That's good. Just a point of clarification, too. So the, there are schools that are hosting the fall mm -hmm. sessions, which are McClintock, Clintock, Maya, Emerson, Mark Twain, Emerson, Mark Twain, Robinson, Captain Gray. Okay, that's quite a few. Yes, yeah. But anyone can go to any, any of the schools. So just to make that clear that yeah. you don't have to be a student or family at that school boundary, you can go to any of those schools for the sessions. Yeah, so. and we tried to spread it out across the district so people right. could yeah. convenience, so the, I guess, So if for your school's family. not one of those schools, that doesn't mean you can't participate. It's for anyone in Pasco, and you can go to any of those schools. Absolutely. On whichever night is convenient for you, you know, without, that will determine where you go. But, okay. but to answer Mr. Christensen's question, when they sign up, do they write an address down, and you could track what school they're, they would, would enroll in? Is that it, something we can do? We do our best to collect as many addresses as possible, yes. So we could tell how many students are coming from the air, the schools that Mr. Christensen, or even just to ask, where would your, what's your boundary school? Some of them might not. Some of them might know. That? Yeah, you could do that too. Ask. We could add that. Anyway, I think that would be. Uh, I would be curious to see that to make On sure. On the sign-in sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our most needy population. And again, maybe it's not ready. Maybe it's you know ready might work for. There might be another program that works better for uh, another population. So. Thank you. And I had, I had one more question for um, Rick. And before I ask it, I don't want it to sound like we're, we're not looking for compliments here, but being part of a, a continuously learning and continuous uh, improvement organization, you said we were doing good things. Did you mean with expanding our programs and offerings or the performance of the kids? What, what um, were you saying? Your offerings. You're offerings, to okay. You're trying to reach populations that need things, okay. doing more, getting the word out, however you can. Yeah. Okay. Pretty Thank much. you. Yeah, that feedback helps us uh, yeah. coming from everybody, knowing what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. So yeah. thank you. You're also having parents who may not have kids in school yet. You're getting them involved in their local school community. It's going to be more comfortable for them. A lot of parents failed at school. They're not literate, so they can get them in there, get them comfortable. Kids comfortable when they come the first day of school. Overall, just going to be a healthier community for them. So y'all yeah. are doing great work. Pretty good. Well, thank you, Ms. Dawkin and, and Mr. Bowles for spearheading that work and, and helping to uh, provide these additional opportunities for our, uh, for our families and residents. I'm going to take out to the school board meeting. Good luck right. with the bond. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Donald thank and Ms. Flatton. Yeah. Oh. Okay, 
So um, our next partner is Karen Weekly. She comes from the Partners for Early Learning, um, and she's going to share a little bit about um, the work that we're doing with them in order to provide those child care provider trainings. So. Thank you for um, being willing to hear about the exciting things that we're doing in your district. Um, Partners for Early Learning, first of all, is a, is a 501c3. We're a nonprofit. We started um, in collaboration with Richland Schools in 2013, and they came to us and basically a group of us in the community and said, we got poverty. We said, uh-huh. Um, <laughs> and we, we need to do something to raise our kids' test scores. And one of the ways that we can reach out is we want to be able to reach a lot of these kids that are being served in child care programs, and what can you do to help us? And so uh, uh, educators, business people got together. We said, well, we, we don't have any money, so let's raise some money. So again, we had um, some business leaders in our community come together and say, we'll sponsor some meetings for early care and education providers. We're not calling them just child care because we have private faith-based preschool, ECAP Head Start child care. It's all free to them. They just come. And what we're finding is, to, is to that, um, so see I made this, this uh, slide that I never will pay any attention to. But what we wanted to be sure that they were getting was high quality professional development. Um, we wanted people that were training them um, People like, like your staff who do, who do some of the training here, people with master's degrees, people with, with uh, PhDs, wherever we can find them, but of course they donate their time to us too. Um, what we've been doing then, so we've offered monthly classes since 2013, 2014 in Richland in English um, for these child care providers. We've averaged 40 to 70 every month for the last few years. In January, we were so excited to be able to start here in Pasco, and we said, um, we, we need to do these in Spanish because a lot of your providers that are high risk, um, they're, they're all going through a system called um, QRIS, many of them, Quality Rating Improvement System. It's something the state has, has put together. And is Suzanne here to talk about no. that? Okay, I'll talk about it then. Um, it's, it's a requirement for them in order to get state subsidy. They have to improve their child, their child care programs. And part of that is 10 hours at least a minimum of continuing education along with some targeted training. So um, when you, but when you're a child care provider and you're taking state subsidy, you're not making a lot of money. So to find professional development of high quality in your language is almost impossible. So this partnership with your district was really powerful for these folks. We've had 60 to 70 people there every month. Um, the last few sessions, as, as Joanna talked about, have been the Ready for Kindergarten. We're going to do some other things, some social emotional kinds of things, some more literacy building. So each month is a different topic and we try to parallel the, um, the English with the Spanish. And the, so if you have, for example, an English speaking childcare provider in Pasco schools, school district area, she's welcome over in Richland. So basically it's anybody across the bi-county area. So the English speakers go to Richland, the Spanish speakers come to Pasco. It's not restricted by where you live at all. Um, the, the great part is it's free of charge, and not only is their training free of charge, they get their continuing education hours. Um, it's called, they're called STARS. Um, they're given from the Department of Early Learning. Um, and they also get materials, because when you're learning new things, <coughs> if you do, if maybe we've talked about a really wonderful strategy for using math materials in your preschool, but you don't have those math materials, so we're able to give them to them so they can take those right back and use them that very next day with, with the children in their programs. So that's where we're, we've been really excited and, and we're really pleased with this uh, turnout here in Pasco because as you talked about those targeted, those high risk kids, um, so many of their child care providers are here um, every, once a month. It's really in incredible. The energy, again, if you have a chance Thursday night, come and join us. The energy in those rooms is amazing with your folks. Um, so. What, Thursday, where would you say it's at on Thursdays? It's here at Booth. Okay, thank you. I have one more slide? Yeah. Okay. I did too. Okay. The other part, um, Partners for Early Learning, is we're, we're, we're an all-volunteer organization. We have no paid staff at all, which is important, so we have to grow very slowly. Um, one of our next goals is, of course, to impact parents because um, programs like Ready for Kindergarten are really excellent, but as you pointed out, you've got to get the parents there. But we know that we can impact parents by um, 
by giving them opportunities and giving them information and education. And so we have some targeted programs going right now. We have one in partnership with Benton County um, through their gang and violence prevention tax, something like that. Anyway, um, so we have uh, targeted families uh, in a home visit model. And I know you guys have home visitors um, as well. And again, that, that's tremendous work in terms of one-on-one -on -one with families. We also have a backpack uh, program um, distributing learning information and toys to uh, families in partnership with communities and schools. We're, again, hoping to grow and impact more families in, in play and learn kind of situations, um, informal groups. Um, so whatever, again, and we're because we are a nonprofit and because we don't have specific guidelines, it's kind of just um, the, direct, the strategic direction is set by our board, so if there's something that PASCO needs, that you, Christy is on our board, um, you know, come, come to her, tell her, this is what we really need. We need partners for early learning to help us with this, and we'd be glad to do that. How do you get your funding? Is it through grants, or is it through school districts that you serve? Uh, we have, yes, some through grants, some through United Way, some through business, community business leaders. We had, uh, when we first had our inception, um, one of the business leaders in Richland basically invited all his buddies and said, write a check. Um, <laughs> and that's what got us started. Um, and so we've got, and now we've got some folks on our board that know other people, you know, people know people, and they say this is a great thing, and we want to help you. So. Be sure and thank those business leaders for yeah. us. Please, thank you. I will. We appreciate it. Yeah. So if I could just interject for one minute. I think the highest number of participants you had at one of your meetings was 74 when I looked at the, yeah. So for each of those child care providers that come, they could have 10 kids, 12. So you're looking at, you know, potentially 10 kids per child care provider at that 74, you know, that 740 students that are touched by these um, training. So I just want to, again, acknowledge the partnership and um, express my gratitude for your willingness to work with us and um, recognize and acknowledge the just potential of the power of this particular initiative to really reach kids in those early years be and to impact that. You know, once they come to us behind, they tend to stay behind. So let's get them level the playing field before they come to us. So thank you so much for your partnership. Yeah, that's pretty remarkable. I mean, that's a huge number of providers, really. I'm shocked that, I mean, that's that's remarkable. And, and you know, like Ms. Phillips said, that the money is always an issue and for the, but you said you literally have all volunteers that no one has a paid, no one has a paid Someday. position. Someday, probably. <laughs> but right now, then literally all your money goes to materials that, that you're, yeah. you're, the resources that you're providing, the child care providers and parents and these, these products. So that's remarkable. I mean, even if when, once you have one paid staff, I mean, that's a huge chunk of money that you're going to, Lose. So that's amazing that there's so many. It's heartwarming to see that there's so many people that are just willing to give of their time to really impact this, and it's surely going to have a huge impact. It is. It's very exciting. And um, we have, I think this is probably one of my favorite groups of people to work with because they are the most appreciative group of ladies and gentlemen um, who are attending. And we have like one of our East Pasco uh, child care facilities. They have 70 kids in there and their director sending their staff. I think they have like six or seven people who who come and attend. And, you know, so they're right there. They're impacting 70 kids um, over right on Oregon Street. So it's, it is pretty exciting. And um, just a lot of families who are or families, providers who are um, taking the materials, I, when our, our colleague from Child Care Aware, some of their coaches are attending or helping out at the trainings and they're, when they're going out to support these providers in their homes as they earn their ratings or their levels, they are seeing the materials being used in those settings with the kids. So um, it's not just coming and sitting and getting, that they're actually applying it as they go back to work. So. Yeah, for board members. <laughs> so just to be clear, you guys do trainings, and then the, from there the child care providers take it back to their facilities, and they're the ones then that implement these ideas and concepts that you've given them. Is it once a month? Mm -hmm. So you do trainings once a month. These people come in, get their trainings, any materials. Okay. Yes, our and Spanish that... provider trainings are typically the fourth Thursday of the month. Okay. Except for November, because that's Thanksgiving. So. Here, and are they here? The right now, they're here. Yeah. Fourth Thursday. Okay, and that's is that your 
website there, Partners yes, for Early yes. Learning? And uh, I'm sure you take donations there. Is that you know, fair? I don't even think there's a button on there to donate. Oh. We are desperately in need of board members as well. So if you have <laughs> colleagues, no, seriously, representing Pasco, we do not have anyone on our board. Uh, Christy's the only one, and she's a you know a district person. But we, if you know business leaders, if you know uh, you know anyone that is passionate about early learning, we would be we would welcome them. So thank you. We uh, greatly appreciate that. Yes. And your work there. So our next um, partner is Cindy Sauceda, and she comes from Catholic Family Services, and she helps to lead the Kaleidoscope Play and Learn groups um, here in Pasco and probably elsewhere too. But um, so please welcome Cindy. Thank you so much. So good afternoon. My name is Cindy Sauceda Cavazos. So it is a very long last name, so. Cindy Salsa, that works just fine too. We just recently made a shift in our name. So as you see on our first slide here, we, um, our, our agency now has, has shifted to Catholic Charities. It's very much universally known and we, we felt, although we, we had some really strong roots in, in this community as Catholic Family and Child Service, we have now um, are, are launching our, our new name and it's Catholic Charities doing the same work. Um, I'm a program manager for Catholic Charities here locally. Um, I am, uh, myself and my team run a very, uh, beautiful project, pregnancy and parenting. It's a lot of elements that serve families from the beginning of life up to age five. Of course, for those of you who are familiar with Catholic Charities and formerly Catholic Family and Child Service, the work that we've done um, for decades really is, is really rooted in, in, in our values, our Catholic social teaching values that really are universal to any faith. We are an agency who serves people of all faith and no faith at all and hires people of all faith. Um, and so that's a very important part of our work is, is that we believe that, that our values are, are rooted really in the preferential option for the poor and really this, this mission to serve most in need. And that's really why I'm here today. Uh, I, I was told I only had about five to ten minutes, so I decided I really needed these little notes because I could talk about the work that we've done specifically in connection to our partnership with the Pasco School District and the ESD um, and United Way. Um, without those partners, we, I, I really wouldn't be able to have this opportunity to speak to you about Play and Learn. So with that said, of course, having being rooted in, in, in an organization that his values are are really concentrated in focusing on the work for the most marginalized is a great opportunity but it's one of our greatest challenges we are a nonprofit and as a nonprofit organization really our 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 goal is always to bring in only the dollars that we need to put them back out to, to families that we serve. And I hope that as a result of, of this time I should have with you, the, that I impress that upon you, that the numbers that, that, that we've been able to bring just in the short amount of time, I really feel tell the story of the work that we've done. And so um, really, again, why I was asked to, to come today is to speak to you about Kaleidoscope Play and Learn. And Kaleidoscope Plan Learn is a promising practice that was developed out of the University of Washington. It really promotes academic readiness in the five developmental domains. It really was created with this niche concept that, that really is born out of uh, this idea that 55% of the children um, uh, are, uh, that we serve are, are not enrolled literally in childcare settings. 
that they're really cared for for what, what um, is referred to FFN care, which is friends, families, and neighbors, which I heard folks um, speak to a, a moment ago. A and really, that was this concept um, that was very important to the values of, of, of creating Kaleidoscope Play and Learn. And so, as such, really this work is focused on the grandmas, on whoever's taking care of this little, this little kiddo, basically. This idea is that those family members, those neighbors, those aunts, those uncles, grandma and grandpas, are really the focus of who Kaleidoscope Play and Learn focuses on. So that means really literally that the single criteria for a family, mom or dad, or as I mentioned, any caregiver, um, is really to have a child under five to come to any play and learn or a jugar y aprender group, which is a bilingual version of this 90-minute week group. Um, Catholic Charities has provided many, many play and learn groups in our region for many years. But for this particular community, we just started this last year, uh, right here in, in Benton and Franklin counties. And in particular, we started an English group in Kennewick, and again, with, with um, funding through United Way, we were able to literally create a beautiful classroom. And a, and a partnership with two of our Catholic Charities housing locations, both in Pasco, we developed these two additional classrooms. So a total of three classrooms. With this funding, we were able to provide two play and learn groups and really noted that with the funding that, that, um, that we were able to obtain, we really couldn't start up our, our, our third East Pasco location, which was a Juari Aprender location. And this again is important to note that this is not just for families living in that housing complex, but it's for any family, any family in this community. And so essentially, this is where the opportunity um, came in from, from the Pasco School District. And really, uh, the, both the Pasco School District and the ESD really collaborated in assisting us and really developing those, bringing those dollars in to allow us to bring in the, the supplies to really create our, our, our ongoing weekly 90-minute group every single Wednesday. So since that, we um, had an overwhelming response. Our impact has been, from my perspective, uh, really, really fantastic. Um, and again, it, it, it leads me really to why I'm here today. It's not just to say thank you because that seed money was of huge impact to many, many families. It's also something that's very important to us because as you can see from, our, from um, some of the statistics that we were able to gain, just this East Pasco location produced, served 122 people, 122 individuals. Um, that's really important to us. It's really important to us to speak to the limitations of the families that, that come to these groups. These are families that are, uh, that are very intimidated by this very academic process. And, and it, it, it is very much a hardship. So one of the things that we're, we're, we're learning from our families that are attending is that they have increased self-confidence. Their surveys are also speaking to the fact that the, the paradigm shift is really occurring where they really are owning their role as the first educator of their children. For parents that have very limited education and sometimes are functionally literate, that is a huge piece for us. So the other part of our model that I think is very, very important to speak to that is really not necessarily shown there on our impact slide is also that this particular component not only focuses on this beautiful 90-minute uh, weekly group that focuses on the five developmental domains, but we also do one-on-one. -on -one. We look at the family as a whole. And that, again, that's enabled um, our services to look at the entire family. As a result of that, one of the really great things that happened that was also a little bit of a challenge was that as we were encountering summer, we knew that a lot of the families that were, go that were attending were either going to stop coming to play and learn because they were going to have their siblings come in and, and, and need to come to a group but this is a zero to five group, or um, they would simply 
come in with, with, with all their tykes. And so we decided that what we were going to do literally was we were going to open our doors and we were going to create a specific uh, a specific summer session that produced uh, 45, we received 45 additional kiddos. Um, that was a, a, a little crazy, but as you could see on this, on this impact slide here, is we brought in some volunteers, some community partners. One of the, one of the circles at the bottom that you see here is, is, is uh, a community member. He's a Happo branch manager, and he's dedicated to early learning. And he came in, and he did, you know, he did this particular really cool thing outside with, with the kids, and it really allowed us to, to again, look at the, the problems that we have systemically and that families sometimes don't come to services because they think that there's a lot of barriers. And we pride ourselves in the idea that we don't look at just one single thing that we can perform. And of course, that sometimes is literally the hardship, is that organizations like ours, we can't do everything. Um, but in this case, it's very important to us that we do one-on-one, -on -one, we do office visits, we look at a family and their particular needs and try to identify ways in serving them. And so again, that impact slide is, is, is important to showcase for you because as a result, just in over a year, we've served over 500 people. And I don't think we could have ever done that without, without the support that we've gotten as uh, I leave this, this time with each of you, uh, I guess today, I just want to impress one thing upon you is that, again, we, we're, we feel very, very, so much appreciation for this collaboration that could have never been possible because we, we really are committed to this population, really specifically in identifying what the barriers are and trying to overcome those barriers through this collaborative project. So, I hope that as we move forward, we are able to continue to serve a very growing population because that's what we see, that the numbers are growing and we would love to begin a fourth group as we move forward. So with that, I, I hope I did not go over my, my, my time limitation. And again, thank you so much. Thank you. No, it's perfect and, and very inspiring. We like to hear these stories because um, from you guys that actually get to go out and do the fun, fun, uh, inspiring work. Because we as a board, sometimes we get to we get to talk about it and set the vision, and then uh, we uh, go about our daily our daily lives or our other jobs, and we don't get to participate in that joy that you guys see every day. So thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. My privilege. So building off of that, we're going to have Aaron Tomlinson, who's one of our ESD partners. Um, who is going to share a little bit about their play and learn groups that they're uh, supporting through the ESD. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. First of all, I just need to say that when I came in the room tonight, I was so excited to see who I would be presenting with because we are partners. When we talk about early learning in our community, we work together in so many areas. And, I, and as Cindy was saying, there's not one organization that can do this alone. And um, when we think about early learning and the importance of connecting to parents in those first five years and helping them understand how important early brain development is and their impact on it, that is like a continued community-wide effort where you are you you just can't give up on that. You can't change behavior till you change attitude, and it takes education to do that. So I'm just excited to be here with all my friends. <laughs> Sorry, no, oh, there we go. Um, so Play and Learn, as was mentioned, is a partnership between the Pasco School District and Catholic Charities and the ESD. And we, we really look to the model that Catholic Charities has in place. Theirs is, is based off of the Kaleidoscope model. We could not afford to implement an actual Kaleidoscope model, but ours, ours is designed off of that model. The funding for our pilot project in Play and Learn has come from Thrive Washington. And um, they received very specific funding to help us target two specific communities in Pasco. Um, play and learn, I don't think I need to go over this again because it has, we have discussed it, but again, it's just really targeting not just parents, but caregivers, especially in that family, friend, and neighbor category who have children aged birth to five. 
Um, and, and I wanted to hit a little bit on why, and I do feel like I'm preaching to the choir, so I won't spend too much time on it, but we know as educators how critical those first five years are. And when you especially look at the first three years, birth to three, and the amount of brain development that's taking place so rapidly, we can't afford to miss the opportunity to try to get to parents to start building those very, very important connections as early as possible. Um, a lot of parents don't understand that they are their child's first and most influential teacher they will ever have in their lifetime. A lot of parents don't understand that it's simple interactions and everyday serve and return activities that build those very important brain connections. And so we've, we've if, if you come from a family where you had modeled for you the importance of education and reading daily with your child, you parents are raising their kids in a home where they're doing some of those really important things that build those early brain connections. But a lot of the families we serve haven't had that modeled for them. So they don't know where to start. In all the years that I've worked with parents, and I don't think there's anyone here that wouldn't feel the same way, you know, the minute that child is born, every parent loves and wants the very best for their child they don't always know how to deliver that. They don't always know how to give them their best. It's my belief that they're always trying to do what was better than what was done for them. And so as early learning partners, we're working together to try and find where those parents were at. And as Cindy mentioned, there are 55% of parents that we're working to connect to. From an ESD perspective, we, we know that there are 25% of families in our community that are captured in federally and state funded preschool programs, ECAP, Head Start, Inspire. That leaves 75% of the families, we're trying to find where they're at and how we get to them to begin this education process. So we know that some are captured in private or center-based childcare, but there are these 50%, 55% of families, where are they? And that's that family, friend, and neighbor care. So our play and learn effort, a lot of the efforts um, around early learning in our region, and certainly coming out of the early learning department at the ESD are really targeted on that, on that FFN community for that reason. So we're really excited about Reach Out and Read because it's one place where we know that families are going to and they respect the, the input from their pediatrician. Um, the two locations that we've been funded to create play and learn sites are at Tierra Vida and Lakeview, very specific housing communities here in Pasco. And we've also, um, and I'll go into a little bit of why, um, we've got a site here in Pasco that takes place on Wednesdays and then we've got a Tuesday and um, and a Tuesday evening, we're actually adding a Thursday evening now, we just decided today, out at Lakeview. So we're really trying to, 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 even though these are in those communities, they're serving anyone who is welcome to come from Lakeview to Tierra Vida, back and forth, um, and any of their friends that they're willing to bring. Because word of mouth and that peer-to-peer -peer interaction is really critical in trying to recruit families into our play and learn settings. Um, we again hold those groups weekly. We average about 10 caregivers per week. Now I say that loosely because Tierra Vida and Lakeview have actually taken very, very different efforts in order to recruit families to the programs. Um, at Tierra Vida, it's been a very slow growth process. We began these just the beginning of April. They're very new. We didn't run them during the summer. Um, we run them in partnership with our after school 21st century community Lear learning center programs because they have staff that are already very engaged with the communities there. Um, they have a home visitor on their team and they just have those connections and relationships that they've been building with those families all year long. And so they're very new sites for us. Um, at Tierra Vida, we, we have more of um, an at-home daytime target market to pull from um, than we do at Lakeview. Lakeview is predominantly um, 
very long working hours for both parents in the home. And so the evenings, we actually have very large turnouts, but it really started at Lakeview with siblings bringing their younger siblings to the play and learn. So we've really had to do some lessons learned around kind of our kickstart of this project. Okay, how do we, how do we get to the parents and encourage them to come versus Terra Vida? You've got the parents coming during the day. Um, and, it, and at Lakeview, we've seen some differences. We, we definitely need to do the word of mouth knocking on the door. Um, we need to be engaging with the father in the house versus the mother in the house to get permission for the mother to come with her children in the evening. Um, providing dinner is not something that we have funding to do all the time. When we do, we see a blowout turnout <laughs> with families coming. Um, and so very different recruitment efforts. Um, Lakeview is much more of that traditional play and learn model where we're, we're tapping into to more of the female caretaker during the day that's coming. Most often it's the mom. Um, and um, ag again, this is a funded project by Thrive for us to learn how to get access to the community, what is effective and what's not effective. This is something at a statewide level that we really don't have a lot of answers to. So, so um, we're, we're learning a lot. We're just kickstarting the second round now, um, the second week of October. And we will also be offering some other very targeted programming that address the social emotional needs of families, Abriendo Puertas and Toddlers to Teens. Um, and those are um, week long sessions um, that families will be invited to with dinner included and all the things that we know and have learned that will get them to the door for the training. Um, and you know, I just really want to emphasize a very dedicated staff in the 21st century learning staff, very dedicated partners who are all a part of this process to reach families. And, and um, if we have a local Benton Franklin Early Learning Alliance that you may have heard of, we could fill this room with early learning partners. And the ways that we find to collaborate for more meaningful engagement with families, where we have families hearing and seeing these same messages over and over again from as many different directions as possible, we're, we're working to kind of change those attitudes. So I get really passionate about this, and I'm sorry if I, you know, went over my time. I don't, I think that was my last slide, yeah. Are there any questions? Okay, well thank you very much. So with both those ladies, you heard them reference the family, family, friends, and neighbors, and that is really the hardest population for us to reach. And so I think these play and learn groups are really instrumental in helping us to reach that population. And so I look forward to some of the future work with that. So um, Lisa Brower Thompson's from also from the ESD, and she is the director of the Early Childhood Education Assistance Program, and she's going to share a little bit about that. Thank you. So this is your four for ECAP in your community, year three for me. Um, I came on board when it was just a growing program that doubled, tripled very quickly. Um, but I'm in awe as I stand here too, and I work with these partners every month in some capacity, but what um, is absolutely staggering to me is that every one of my partners works from the same capacity. It's a whole family approach. It is not just the child we're working on. Um, and that takes a lot of work, a lot of hours, and most of us will be seeing um, Christy especially. Christy and I will be texting at 10 o'clock at night to make this program function the way that it does. But it is changing lives, and our data supports it. So, um, oh, I should have brought my glasses. <laughs> um, this is just kind of a summary of last year's results. So, um, every site gets a rating. And when you come into ECAP as a contractor through a school district, you're typically giving a rating of a three. But to maintain that, um, you have to be observed and go through um, an early achievers rating, which all of our sites maintain a four at this point. Um, we will approach trying to get a higher rating. There is not one on this side of the state, as I understand it, that has a rating of a five. I believe there's a couple on the west side. Um, so we're going to strive for that. Uh, but that rating is based on the interactions of the teacher and the children and also the environment itself. 
Um, so there's two strong components that they need to meet. Some of the limitations in a school classroom make that a real challenge to meet just because we don't have two bathrooms in there and we don't have multiple numbers of sinks and things like that. So they're unrealistic. Um, but that's not our focal point. We're really concerned really about those interactions predominantly. Um, family supports, I'm super proud of this fact because I really believe this ties in with my partners that it's what happens with our families. 127% of the required number of visits were actually accomplished last year, which means they had to meet a certain number of hours with every family um, that they were assigned to. I believe it's each family is three hours and I can tell you they far exceed that. Some families will be um, that does not include their texting with them or their phone calls with them. That is just their scheduled meetings with them. 83% um, of our children received well checks um, this year, which is up from 60% previous years. We're not allowed to restrict a child from ECAP. Uh, so if they don't have a well check, they still can come into our program. But we strongly <laughs> encourage it from registration, the very beginning, to try to get this from them. Sole purpose being to connect them to a provider to get the services they need initially and have them ready for kindergarten again. Um, we've tried a couple of different methods. One of the things we're going to try this year that I'm really excited about, we've partnered with um, a physician from Cadillac is helping us. Um, and another provider here locally with a center near the ESD is willing to come and set up some um, stations up at the ESD on an evening where we can collaborate and have families come there. There's still some fear and inhibition sometimes to connect to a provider, especially depending on their immigration status. So in order to keep those children well, we want to make sure that we provide a safe place for them to have their well checks. What, so what changed the percentage? Were you able to break down those inhibitions um, and encourage them to take it? Is that, is that what did it? The trust and the time that we've had with them now, the program's been in existence for a few years. Um, I think the other part is really that family support connection. I think that ties to that trust. They build those relationships there. They encourage them to come. Um, some of our provi or some of our family supports will take their families to a physician. I mean, they they go extreme measures to make these happen. We've also upped the um, application process within our own house. When when families come to us, we'll take them into a room, sit down with them, talk them through the whole process, and really give them the understanding of the how and the why they need to do the well checks. So, um, 261 per, uh, families were served in, or this year will be served in six different school districts and 120 families served in the PASCO sites. Um, teaching strategies goals results showed our significant growth. I have some of that data for you. These are our three-year-olds, and this is consistent with three-year-olds um, in all of our ECAP sites and all the other districts as well. The three-year-olds show this huge growth in the, the first year with us. Um, I always find it fascinating that when the state struggle is maybe math and literacy for a year, we really uh, target going back to the training and significance. So we'll start working on those areas with our teachers, and ironically, our data uh, kind of supports that the year before math and literacy were much lower. So um, we're seeing the progress. What, what was the six six schools? Is that in the region or when you say six schools what it, six or six districts? Six districts. So we're in Othello, so North Franklin, Othello, uh, Burbank, Finley. So this is in your eastern south or southeast Washington region or something? Okay, thank you. Yeah. And this is a tiny section of people though, only 11 children were... So we only had 11 three-year-olds <clears throat> of, of the kids that we got data on. So we can't, sometimes children in our programs, well a lot of times children in our programs are coming and going. Um, with our migrant <clears throat> families it's hard to maintain some of that data. But of the children, I'll show you the the bulk of the children here. And this is just PASCO's data, by the way. This isn't the 260, <clears throat> this is the 120. So we have, what, 90, 93, 94 students captured in their data. Okay. Um, but it's a little less in the four-year-old, but knowing they came to us with almost no growth to where they're at today is pretty powerful to us. When you say growth percentage, does that mean percent that they get right where they should be at the end of the year? Right, or percentage ready for kinder. So okay. based on where they should be as a five-year-old entering kindergarten, this is, they're 79% ready for okay. kindergarten. And they started at like 21% for social, okay. Yeah. And that's a one year worth this of? This is one year's data, oh. just last year's. Okay. Yeah, just for four-year-olds on this slide and just for three-year-olds on the previous slide. 
Are we going to continue capturing this so we can oh, yeah. see? Okay, great. Yeah. So, so when, I guess when I say, sorry, when I say one year, I mean they started in the fall and the 79, the stuff on the right is in the spring for one, for one cohort. Is that what this is? So we have, we, have, we don't classify them as cohorts, but yeah. just that age group yeah. that started with us, this is not the three-year-old and four-year-old. It's individual each year. So next year, our three-year-olds will be captured um, with our new. So um, it's one group, though. Mm -hmm. it, and so that's every year. That's awesome. What we're still working on and working towards is how to keep that data collected as we go forward. Um, as I got to know Mark the other day, I'm, I'm hoping that I can work with him in some capacity to keep that data being collected. Um, so PASCO uh, locations currently, we have Kids World, which is a brand new facility for us, opening tomorrow, it's day one. Um, we're really excited about this opportunity. There's two full day classrooms there, um, which were located in our Whittier site and Chess. Last year, I believe. Yeah, last year. And we moved both of those over to Kids World this year with one open classroom with the growth potential um, for being ready if new slots come available. And I'll address more of that at the end of this conversation. But um, this was a facility that was licensed childcare in our community. The uh, providers were really struggling with how to keep the facility afloat with a lot of our, we, we figured probably a lot of our ECAP students were actually attending there. Um, so they were subsidized and the minimum wage going up, the, the provider was really concerned that they didn't know if they could keep those doors open. So we started talking about what is the possibility of subcontracting, maybe ECAP slots in there. And through our conversations realized that actually a lease might be the best option. <coughs> so ESD and um, Pasco School District decided to make this collaboration happen. and. Um, we're really excited because we can move a lot of our staff in there and be that hands-on direct contact with the families versus them having to go to the ESD to connect with us or you know, the classroom we can't house multiple numbers of staff. So it's, it's much more efficient use of space. And then we're of course looking really forward to the Early Learning Center um, come January. Um, some of the benefits that we, as, as Kristen and I are really strategizing, how do we make this really work for us? Um, transportation headaches could be reduced just because you're going to fewer sites. Um, the growth potential, just people recognizing the facility as this is going to be our ECAP building or this is going to be our ECAP building a lot easier than multiple um, schools and families get really confused. They come to us and they're like, but I live right next to this school and you're transporting me to this part of town to go to this class. So we really think this is going to be become more of a home feel for families. Um, and then our staff is using it as, like I said, offer, uh, office space. And there's also the growth potential. There's a plenty of property on there that if we ever decided we wanted to put um, uh, a portable up there, the capacity is there. And with expansion in our state, that is the number one concern. Nobody has space within their schools. Um, I, don't, I don't know how familiar you are with ECAP, but I wanted to point out the services that are provided. Um, all of our children go through like kind of a nutrition awareness. We do a BMI of each child, so their height and their weight are taken. If there's nutrition concerns within the family, we have a nutritionist that we consult with that will go out and talk to the family. We have a nurse on staff um, almost full time now. And he's, it, Rachel's actually the nurse from last year, but doing the hearing screening. Um, every child gets, receives a hearing screening. Every child receives a vision screening. Um, last year we were able to purchase a spot scanner, which is what the um, woman on the far right is holding. And you, you literally hold this up to the child's eyes and um, there's flashing lights so the children can focus on it. But within seconds it will take a reading of the eyes and determine whether or not the child needs to have um, a referral to an optometrist. Um, typically looking for a wandering eye or just early um, concerns that may be impacting their, their vision. And then we also do, last year we did three dental screenings per child. Um, it's always amazing to me that we can have as many as seven emergencies in a year and we know when kids are hurting, they're not learning. Um, last year this hygienist has just been wonderful with our team. She goes out to every classroom. She really gets the children to interact with the activity before she even does their own exams. Um, but seven emergencies, which means the teeth are um, impacted so heavily that usually typically will have to be removed. 
Um, so we refer them or get them connected with a dentist and follow through with our family supports to make sure that they actually carry through with the action. So this year, currently, we have 129 children enrolled in PASCO. Um, 56 children on the PASCO wait list. Today it was at 59. They're coming in every day as quickly as they're going into classrooms. Um, there's still some, we get so many in the summer that we don't know whether or not they'll just apply for a couple of different programs. So we're working um, in collaboration with our partners now, trying to develop a better system for families, trying to simplify the process in a way that families don't come to us and say, I, you know, I thought I enrolled for your program, but I really enrolled with this program. Um, and one of those uh, collaborations is regional. It is all the ECAP and Head Start partners called um, Head Start ECAP Connected now. And we're looking at even hiring somebody as a regional partner to sit in either DSHS, WorkSource, um, and some of the environments where the families we serve typically visit to help support families um, finding programming. So they'll come in and they'll say, yeah, we look at this, this factor and this factor and we decide this is the best program for you. But that would be funded by all of our partners together. So there's, there's collaboration happening in a community that to me is just really exciting because it's gonna, in the long run, benefit our families. Thank you. So um, with the Early Learning Center, um, last I had heard we were on target. Um, they're in there working, getting the plumbing done, um, getting the building all ready for hopefully opening on time in January. We're excited with that to have um, our, all of our part day ECAP slots plus our special ed programs housed in the, um, housed there together. Um, all of our special ed classrooms will move over there in January. We have just one teacher who has chosen to stay at the, the school that they're currently at until June when they, that program would move over. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing on as we look forward to the opening of the center is really looking at um, planning and uh, making a smooth transition to the center. So with that, for example, on our tier day, I was able to meet with our preschool staff and go through a compression planning process to really look at some things such as um, some of the facility planning. So um, talking about, you know, when we look at a classroom, what are those basic needs that we need to have in every classroom to make them standard um, and make it a, a really um, inviting place for our families and our students. Um, also went through and um, which was very helpful to me is talking with the staff what are some of their worries or thoughts or you know, things around that that transition so what are those things that we want to consider um, so that we communicate things well and make that a smooth transition for them um, and our families so helping um, collect some questions about that um, another piece was really looking at what is going to be that vision or that climate that we want to build and establish within the center so that our families and our students and our staff all feel welcome and um, take some ownership in, in that um, facility. Um, and then beginning some conversations, we don't want to upset the fruit basket in January, but beginning some conversations so that as we embark upon our next year, um, how are we gonna plan to um, provide our kids those uh, more inclusive, authentic, inclusive opportunities? So partnering with the ECAP um, staff to help engage in some of those conversations throughout this year so we can plan it well for implementation in the fall. Um, other conversations that we've been working with, um, transportation as we shift mid-year, it shifts transportation mid-year, and so trying to work that so that that is as smooth as possible and seamless for families so that they don't have to worry about little gaps in services for their, their little ones to get to school. And then um, we're hoping to plan uh, some kind of an open house or something, you know, without an exact start date, it's hard to determine that yet, but some kind of opening invitation for families to come before their children actually start so that they can see where is it my child's gonna be attending, much like we would at a, our regular elementary schools oftentimes before school starts. And then another big event that we have coming up um, is our early learning fair and 
this kind of started over a conversation at lunch, but um, we really want to make it a big community event. And so we have scheduled it on June 2nd at Edgar Brown Stadium and really talking about, um, because this is a community event, this is having our little ones start at Edgar Brown Stadium where, you know, several years later they're going to be graduating from high school. So really planning it big so that it encompasses things such as, you know, kindergarten registration. We have all of our, um, like, uh, private, our ECAPs, our Head Starts, um, uh, other licensed child care providers, you know, everybody we can possibly to help um, connect families with. Um, I do get a lot of questions about some of those kinds of things. So I'd like to be able to have those resources available so families can go and find what's going to be the right match for their family. Um, as well as um, our agencies and you know local agencies and resources that can be available to help parents gather some of that information. So some of the same partners that you're hearing from today in addition to many others that we would have available um, for family, families to just kind of go through and see what kind of um, things are piquing their interest or meeting their needs and connecting them with those resources and things in our community, as well as them planning some fun events for families to um, inter interact with um, during that day. So I'd just like to remind the board, this event happened, it was in March, but it was a reschedule from, it w had originally been scheduled and we had to cancel it because of the bad weather, so we rescheduled it in March. And even with the reschedule, there was 18 community agencies that partnered with Christy around this event, and there was 257 participants. So the idea was to utilize that very successful event, even with a reschedule and bad weather, to be a catalyst for what would become, what we're hoping that would become kind of in a traditional kind of institutionalized event where it's this amazing kickoff for the incoming kindergarten class and a community celebration for that incoming kindergarten class at Edgar Brown, where they will eventually be graduating from. So we're hoping that this becomes kind of a significant signature lighthouse event for Pasco, and not only for the school district, but as a celebration of the community, parents, and community partners. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dawkins. Any questions or comments from the board? Have we been able to increase our ECAP slots by the 25% that we needed for that? I don't million. know if it's actually 25%, but we did have 120 last year, and it's 140 this year. Yeah. And there's, there's hope, actually, for October at, at usually the end of October, contractors that were given slots, um, if they're unable to fill them, they get redirected to uh, next recipients with ISD and PASCO and the federal two of the teams are serving would be that. So just for clarity for the board, um, the ESD applied for additional slots on our behalf and were not awarded them through the Department of Early Learning. Marie Sullivan, Eric Bulls, and ESD staff has been working in collaboration with the Department of Early Learning since finding out about that and have been really strongly advocating for our slots um, and that will continue um, throughout this fall so that like was mentioned, as slots are not filled that will um, benefit from those unfilled slots. So um, the ESD did apply on our behalf and we were not awarded the slots. So so we're capable of adding them. We're prepared Correct. to. Yeah. We were prepared, we were capable. the wait list, there's people that want them, we just weren't given those. So we Correct. essentially did our part, fulfilled our obligation and to provide those spots, but they just didn't award it to us. Correct. And, and we're I, still prepared to add them. Once correct. Get... Correct. And I want to acknowledge Marie Sullivan's efforts on our behalf and kind of tracking down and helping provide as much information as possible, not only to the school district, but to the ESD to help us navigate and get connected to the right people at the Department of Early Learning to troubleshoot exactly what happened, kind of um, fill in some some missing information for us and then help us um, identify the right people to collaborate moving forward. So it's kind of like we're down but not out kind of a situation, you know. So we'll just continue to collaborate with the Department of Early Learning and maximize those resource people to help us continue to get traction for Pasco kids. And we have the capability to add an afternoon session at Longfellow tomorrow if we needed to. And then also there is that other additional classroom space at Kids World. So that could be um, a significant number of students that we could so start we don't, serving. But we don't have the capability of adding an extra 60 to accommodate all the kids on the wait list? 
Not yet. <laughs> yeah, we, we have space. We just don't have the What, what are the chances ECAP? of getting those slots filled through ECAP in the next year? I can tell you I cannot guarantee anything, but I'll tell you that I got an email from the VEO saying um, be prepared. Yay. And you know, another way to, to offer them something would be to have more half day services than full day and or change the number of days per week that provide services, then we could reach more of those students. So that would be something that we should look at, I think. So, yeah, that's a question I was going to ask. The uh, So we've got half days. So currently the ones at Learning World, what's that called? Kids, Kids World. World. Are full day. Mm -hmm. Are any of our slots in the district Whittier? Longfellow, are they half day? Or are Those they all are all day? half day, part day. They are half day. The, the 40 that are at the Kids World site are our original 40 that we got four years ago that were housed at Captain Gray, and those were only full day. Okay. Um, and then with any of the expansion we've had since then, they've all been part day. Are we getting any pushback from DEL to go to full day versus half day? Originally, that was the push in the recent email that I was alluding to. Um, they will not be distributed in full day. People do not give up their full day very easily. Um, it's actually harder to keep the part day programs because a lot of families need the full day care. Right. Um, which is part of that juggling and finding a part time job care or home provider care unless they ever have a BTF to so come in. Um, but I know that we will not get full day. This year, we get the which is what we're to take. Very good. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to all of our partners. We appreciate everything you do. And as I mentioned, we really started talking about this. I remember sitting over here, it was about four years ago, and most of the members on the board were on the board, and we were talking about our district strategic plan and also our legislative priorities. And I think we, as board members, we we're, were kind of naive. We were going, if we provide a facility, everything will work, you know? And, and as we started digging into it, we, we said, we'll provide a facility, we'll have ECAP. That'll be our one partner. And as we started looking into this, you know, we, we had this kind of paradigm shift, um, for us at least, uh, going, we need partners. We need other people to help us. Because when we first proposed this, there is some uh, a good portion of the community that is saying, why are you guys even jumping into early learning at all? It is not the responsibility of the district, K-12, that's it. And we as, as board members are looking at this going, well, we can see that a dollar here saves many dollars down the road for remediations. And we're going, this is a no-brainer for us. But we couldn't spread that message, you know. And, and as some of you guys mentioned, it's not just teaching the kids, it's teaching the families and teaching the community that a that dollar spent here saves many dollars in the future with this early learning. So we appreciate your partnership in helping us uh, not just teach our kids, but teach the community and, and help us uh, provide more opportunities for our, our kids and their families. So thanks a lot, and uh, we appreciate your time tonight. So for those who'd like to join us, our regularly scheduled board meeting is at 6.30, and uh, we will return at that time. Thank you.